Where do you feel is the biggest bottleneck at the moment? The future is going to be hybrid. The data formats each of these departments use is different. They're really not synchronized. Now you have to come up with kind of a universal translator that allows you to connect these two. You have to take a layered approach. Before we get to Jarvis, the fully automated design, maybe the right approach is just to educate people on low code. Arguments only happen when you have faulty information in front of you. We think something that must be automated because it's going to happen over and over again, and then it doesn't. There's no right or wrong answer like when to start when to stop this is all experience it's never the technology that's a barrier it's always the people mike welcome to the show welcome hello nice nice to have you on the show so today we'll talk about kind of how we simplify work as engineers maybe in the what i would call it maybe modern world with modern technology with maybe a particular focus on local technology but we'll talk okay. about that in a couple of minutes. So can you give the audience a little bit of an intro? Like who is Mike in the first place? Um, where are you working at? I mean, your hoodie gives it away, kind of. So. <laughs> you can barely <laughs> see it, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's a big ball. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a narrow ball. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I'm Mike Rao, a tech sales engineer. I'm leading the tech sales team at Sonera. And uh, I've joined Sonera last year. Um, I have a long history working in the... Um, software industry strange thing i'm a mechanical engineer so don't ask me how i got into software but different story yeah. cool really cool um so i mean let's uh, delve straight into it right the current stage of mechanical engineering i mean you have a lot of um, industry experience mike maybe talk from your own perspective like how is engineering being done today and what is really maybe quote unquote grinding your gears on how engin how how engineers actually work nowadays Yes, I, I think I hear the same story over and over every day when I talk to, to people in the industry. And, and that's pretty much my experience too, that that you're working in a department that's really closed off and siloed, but you're always driven to you know innovate and expand and automate, reduce time and save costs. Well, the biggest hurdle is really that that all these silos have, first of all, a communication barrier. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And... and it doesn't mean really that the people don't talk to each other. Uh, they somehow do, but they have different backgrounds. But also the data formats each of these departments use is different. Uh, and they're, not, they're really not synchronized. And mm -hmm. the other thing is that, that they all use different tools. And these tools don't talk to each other. So the problem is how do you get data from A to B? How do you get that information that can that it comes with that file or with that software from A to B. And it's always the same story. The, you, you run into a very lengthy design process and that really incorporates design simulation, manufacturing, pre post processing, everything because of the lack of communication and uh, synchronization between tools and departments. That's, that's pretty much the same every day. Yeah. Do you feel? I feel like in almost every industry, it's always the same narrative. Like we want to have an ROI. We talk about al almost always the same KPI. So uh, reduce time to market. You you kind of yeah. get the hang of it at some point. Where do you where do you see the biggest bottleneck in terms of tools at the current stage? I mean, we know about these tools, right? Ansys, whatever, other yes, like yes, source yes. systems. Where do you feel is the biggest bottleneck at the moment? Is it just a language barrier so that the design team uses a different language than, I don't know, at the C level? What, where do you see the issue? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I mean, a lot of these big uh, software rooms, they don't really talk to each other. I mean, they talk, but I mean, in the sense of where, like the their co technology doesn't communicate with each other. That's the biggest mm -hmm. barrier. And then there's also a barrier of these smaller software vendors. They come up with a really innovative solution. They create a new data format, and that somehow doesn't talk to to the all the other vendors. So it's there's a whole array of software solutions that does great things, but they just don't talk to each other. They, the, the, the data forms are not exchangeable. I think that's the greatest barrier to something that we're running into right now. Yeah. Um, I actually talked yesterday to Ralph Alpeter from Facton, and he had the same yes. argument when, when we talk about cost engineering, right? If the, the <laughs> tools kind of have to talk to each other, you kind of have to talk to different departments, streamline everything. Yes. So how can we overcome this kind of what I would call it maybe fragmented solution space? Um, is there a, maybe a common language that engineers can speak in terms of tools? There is somehow, I mean, the, when, when you talk to engineers, the most of them use Excel sheets or some text files, and that's, that's yeah. what it comes down to. Uh, because that's a, a simple universal language, but that's not the future, of course. Um, there are some ideas 
using, you know, ontology based data systems, how you describe mother and father relationship between data. Mm -hmm. um, it's all in development. And I haven't seen really um, a deployment of that new technology or new architecture in an in engineering world. So I think we have to do, we have to take a layered approach, like step by step before we get to Jarvis, like the, the fully automated design, design me anything I want thingy from Star Trek example, like hello computer, do what, do what I tell you. I think that's not going to happen overnight. I think it, it will take us time to get there. Mm -hmm. And I think the first approach is just uh, the connection between engineering tools. I mean, that's just the, the most simple thing you can do. But even that is a really big step, big hurdle, because as I said, the most big vendors don't talk to each other. Now you have to come up with a kind of universal translator that allows you to connect these tools. So yes, that, that is that is the techno technology we need in the future. That's the first thing. Yeah. yeah, you kind of mentioned it already, like how is it being done today, actually connecting different tools together? I mean, there's gonna be a mess at the end of the day, right? If you talk about the whole product <laughs> development process, you talk about like the idea, the CAD geometry at some point, simulation, CAE, and then down the line manufacturing. I think it's gonna be a mess, isn't it? It is, I mean, I've done it myself and you really lose time you you waste time literally in the moment you just forget a digit or a commata jesus christ you wouldn't know until the end that you messed up and then you have to do mm -hmm. the whole thing again and there's no automation as soon as you start doing things manually there's there's potential of failure always so you you're not only wasting time when creating failure you always waste time because you have to check yourself all the time and if if we can automate this whole process, I mean, this is, oh my God, it would relieve so much pain from the engineers and the engineers could finally focus on being creative. You know, that's what they're for. We talk, obviously there has to be a shift, a transformative shift in the tool landscape, but how do you, yes. how do you feel engineers have to change? Because sometimes we might have maybe, I don't know, old, older colleagues could even be young colleagues who maybe don't see the vision and the mission of such yes. tools. Um, how do you think engineers, maybe their mindset has to change in, in the future? Oh, that's a great question. Like, how do you think how I, how I changed my mindset? <laughs> because I learned uh, from the conservatives. Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, be, becoming more open-minded, I would say. Uh, being more communicative, I would say. Also cross-functional, cross-department-wise. That was yeah. probably your biggest hurdle, I, I would assume. I'm not sure, maybe you could talk about it. It was. I mean, you... you you get in the industry and your first job is most likely, you know, senior engineer, uh, sorry, not junior engineering, mm. a junior engineering role, working with a couple of senior engineers and a department leader. You get bad or some of them are conservative. If you're lucky, you have a really innovative guy who can teach you a lot, but you pretty much challenged on a daily basis to challenge the others. So you have mm. to question every day. It's like, why are we doing this? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, can we do things differently? And hey, I know the better way of doing things. So you have to establish yourself you know, by asking critical questions, proving that what you're asking or what, you, what you're proposing does make sense. You know, at some point, people listen to you, but it's a long process. That's, yeah, absolutely. that's, a, that's a key. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of communication, maybe te the technology itself. I mean, we talked about low code in the beginning. Like, yeah. how, where do we move towards if we think about the future? Is it really low yeah. code or maybe a mix of high code versus low code? Like, how do you see it personally? Yeah, I guess it's the, the future is going to be hybrid. So it's not mm -hmm. going to be one or the other. It's, it's going to be a, a mix of multiple things. It's going to be low code. Um, it's going to be a lot of scripting and programming as we've done in the past. So Python mm. or C Sharp, because a lot of people are quite fast using Python and C Sharp code because they're trained in it. And I guess the problem is that we learn and forget. So mm. if you teach someone, educate someone the low code, he can become proficient. If he can remain in that field and it, it becomes a benefit to the company, then you have a couple of people you know, trained in that particular soft field of software. And then you have people who do Python and C Sharp, but you also have other people who are just consumers. You know, they, they just go to the methods department and ask for, hey, I know automation. I need to, this to be automated. And then there's an even more visual way of, you know, describing what kind of automation you want. So it's, it's a layered approach um, and it's going to be mixed everywhere. It's not going to be one, the one process that describes it all. It's going to be, 
a lot of low-code in company C and a lot of scripting in the same company in a different department. So, so the key is now, how do we make sure that even in that mixed world, like all these things talk to each other, they're all connected, they all can communicate with each other. We're not creating another pro problem right now. Yeah. So maybe going back to the personality type of an engineer of the future, it might not be a T-shaped personality in the sense of that, you know, one area very well, maybe it's more general, yeah. maybe also a hybrid personality in the sense of you have a pie, like the Greek simple pie, where you have, you go yes. broad, but you have a couple of areas or two areas where you go very deep, maybe in the future. Yes. And I think it really depends on the time in your life and your career where you are, you know? So you, you probably study mechanical or software engineering, and then you start in one area, become really strong, and then mm -hmm. it always remains your strengths. But some areas, other areas grow as well, and, and they shift, you know, and it depends on your time, your career, and also, I guess it depends on the company where you're at right now and your job. So there's always a core, like, yeah. Of what do you know, what do you focus on? And if you're a Python programmer, you are a Python programmer. Everything is somehow connected to Python, I guess. But um, the shift happens always. It's it's agile. Yeah. I think agile is a good word. I wanted to ask you if you're a big proponent of actually working on your weaknesses or working on your strengths as an engineer. What is I tried approach? both, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> I tried I tried to, to, to work on the weaknesses, uh, focus on the weaknesses, and then I forgot about the strengths. And then I tried to focus on the strengths you know, all through all these different processes and tools. So I focused on the strengths, and then the fallout of the weakness was great. And now I'm trying to balance. You look, look at the positive side of the strengths I have, but also focus on the weakness. Don't look at the fallout. Look at the, the waves you create. So, um, as an engineer, yeah, engineers are most of the time maybe you know we're very opinionated sometimes mm -hmm. yeah so so if we have an argument or oh, we have one we find yeah yeah absolutely um maybe it brings us to the point of like a cross cross department and maybe communication again like if we talk about yes. low code how do you in terms of transparency and communication how do you think this will facilitate the communication of the future Maybe, maybe you're getting into an argument. Is it more likely to get into an argument using low code or high code? No, I think the argument, um, the argument will go away because um, arguments only happen when you have faulty information in front of you. Mm -hmm. So facts, your argument was facts, right? And if, if you don't have proper facts, um, then, then, then it becomes an argument. So if, two people with two different opinions only look at the facts and there's one single source of truth because a single source of truth means you have cat FEA and manufacturing connected and eventually cost. Then there's a, then the solution of your problem that you argue about is not just one, two or three It's actually a whole range. And you know, it's a multidimensional problem. And then the answer is, well, there is no one solution, but, in that domain, you can find a solution. And then the argument becomes, okay, <laughs> what is our solution? Where do we look for a solution? And then it becomes more a trade-off. So you, you you won't fight anymore, but it becomes more a trade-off, like a negotiation. You're like, hey, I want more, I want a more cost-efficient design or I want more, a lighter design. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you have to you have to negotiate and make a deal. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you talked about fact-based uh, arguments, which I really like, by the way. But how do you, if you use a low-code solution, verify and validate your solution? So let's say you start from scratch, you kind of build a system, and on top of that, yes. it's kind of a living living project, right? It grows some mm -hmm. branches, and it will grow bigger and bigger. How do you keep track and verify and validate these kind of projects to always stay fact-based at the end of the day? Oh, that, that's a great question. I use a lot of charts, to be honest. Um, I think that's that's priority number one. Like really document everything mm -hmm. um, in multiple layers, like uh, multiple version, multiple layers, and then not only look at what you do right now, but look at the history, what you have done in the last six months. So so look at the progress of a project. How does the design develop? Parts, number, mass, all those things. So you, I'm not only tracking like single component at that day to day i'm actually looking at the whole system the whole the whole thing and that really requires that everything is connected because um most important is that i get access to the insights to the information 
But if they're hardly accessible, then facts are missing and I don't have an overview. And that <laughs> leaves me without confidence of what I'm doing is right. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think even if you use a local solution, right, you can always have uh, like basically outputs in between where you can see like intermediate results or whatever, maybe a table output, a report, whatever, uh, that kind of helps you to yeah. understand what's what's going on in between. Um, interesting. Do you feel like maybe also kind of mixing now the topic of local versus the engineering expertise, do you feel like engineers need to fully understand every single step of the local process? Because I'd say the engineer only has to understand kind of what's going on a little bit behind the scenes yeah. and just uses yeah. the kind of the blocks, the features, the functions, and then he can still talk to a subject matter expert if needed. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm so, I share the same opinion. I, I don't think that me personally as an engineer needs to understand everything that that's behind the scenes. The only thing I'm interested in is the outcome. You know, I, I have a problem. I know what's the input. And I know what's my desired outcome. So eventually I guess what's my outcome. I don't need to understand the whole thing. You know, when I buy a car, the only thing I need to understand, where do I fill in gas and where's the gas pedal and the steering wheel? I don't care. Okay, maybe the brakes are important too. Um, but that's the only thing I care. I don't care about how the engine works. I don't care how the seat is assembled and how it gets repaired. Um, there are other people, specialists to do that. And that's the same for low code, I think. You... You want people to build your your code, your automation, but as an engineer, you really don't mind about like how it's done. You know, just you want to use it, and if you can share feedback, how it gets, how it could be improved, great. If you understand how it's done, even better. But now, I'm with you. <laughs> I don't need okay. to know the details. Yeah, uh, interesting. It brings us kind of to the point of transparency, right? How transparent do you need yeah. to be? Is it okay if it's a black box? Probably not. It's maybe too black then. Maybe we're yeah. somewhere in the middle where it's like a gray box. So you don't really have to know what's going on behind the scenes. But if you wanted to, you could still kind of get the hang of it and maybe reach out to the support team, ask them, hey, how is this actually being calculated? Stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's the, the whole methodology, the idea of a platform. You know, what is a platform? Is a platform something that's already ready, that's functioning? And I always take up the example of the iPhone. People call the iPhone a platform. Yes, it is a platform because you can add a lot of apps on it, right? You can make it a multi-functional device. But an iPhone by itself is already really useful, right? It has basic functions that are great. And that's the same for low code. It, it has to come with basic functions like that become really useful. But when you add apps to it, it becomes even more useful. So that brings me to that that gray box and low play gray box and black box approach. I think mm -hmm. I think what people really want and what I want, to be honest, is it's just a gray box. Something that's really useful and functioning, or something that I can customize. And even if I want to take it to the next level, I can customize it even further. I can build on top of it, you know, make mm -hmm. it bigger. Absolutely. Where do you feel in the educational stage of an engineer, let's say, be, becoming a student, then maybe being a junior engineer, <laughs> becoming a senior engineer, where in the stage do you think someone should actually learn about low code? Maybe after the studies, in the studies, maybe in the industry, yeah. or is it kind of, it's maybe it's irrelevant, like everyone can learn it, considering or maybe yeah. given that you have the right upskilling system or maybe academy in place that kind of helps people to, to learn about the tool? That's a great question. Yeah. How do we... Yeah, where do we start? I just learned low code pretty much two years ago, the first time. Yeah. Um, no, actually a little bit earlier, um, two or three years ago. So it wasn't really an industry, it was on the job. But I know that a lot of young students in engineering, they start coding with Python very early on in the in the second or third semester. Um, so I think it doesn't make sense, to be honest, to learn things early on, you know, coding uh, for a mechanics engineer, it is as important as, you know, for a software developer. Okay. That's interesting. Any, like I'm thinking probably if I think back when I was a student, when would I have learned yeah. low code? I think if you immediately learn low code, I think we kind of do, right? If you think about Simulink, you kind of learn it in your yeah. bachelor's, this is kind of low code but you still have to understand what parameters are you typing into the boxes of Simulink? Like, what does it yeah, actually mean? I, uh, 
maybe you should still be very strong in the fundamentals, like kind of understand how yeah. something works in case you need to debug it. So maybe, I don't know, maybe after four, five semesters, if that makes sense. Could be. Hey, or maybe in parallel. Learned, yeah, but when have you learned, um, you know, writing program diagrams and like if else loops and all the things, not just uh, on a schematic level. F first semester at uni when you learn about Java. Horrible language, by yeah, the way, yeah. but that's another topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but language. see, that's this is the beginning of low code, I would say. It's like when you write your first program, like... On a schematic level, that I think that's kind of local, right? But on a, on paper, yeah, that that is true, though. Yeah, yeah, I th yeah. Maybe maybe that's maybe the best approach. Maybe again, like a hybrid kind of thing where you learned how to code on paper. We did it on paper, by yeah. the way. Like we could use computers, but still, the exam was on paper. But yeah. on parallel, you kind of learn about these diagrams and maybe low code, low code thinking. That's kind yeah. of makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that's what we Just, all did. You know, when when I think back to my university times you you go to the lecture and you make a lot of notes on paper mm -hmm. and uh, you write your exams on paper all the calculations are on paper maybe you you're you're allowed to use a calculator but for integrals no way um, but at some point later in, in, during my studies and you get introduced to fem fea and yeah. all that you calculate on paper well becomes just now <laughs> so electronic uh, so I think I think maybe the right approach is just to to educate people on low code, you know, first visually like with hand to learn it, and then directly get them into the software. You know, they they can make the connection. Yeah. And I think and I think Sinora is kind of a pioneer in this space, right? Like even if you're a student, you have absolutely yeah. no idea what low code means. You just get into the academy, learn about something, and just get started, basically, which is I think is really really cool. Um, so I think at the end of the day, maybe it doesn't really matter what age you are, what stage you are at. Um, Absolutely. I mean, the academy I think the, is great. I think the, what is most important is that, um, what's your problem and how would you solve it? Yeah. And if you're looking at your, if your daily tasks that become repetitive very fast, like, and that happens quite often. It's like you just go into the job and then you do something and then you realize, oh, I have to do the same thing today and tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow I have to do it twice. Then it's already a task that can be automated. But then, then you ask yourself, okay, how do I automate that? How do I make my life easier? Um, yeah. And if you already know low code at that point of time, then your first step is you try to solve the problem low code because that's the easiest thing you can do. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just create a Python program for a simple problem you have. But if there's low code already, you know it. Then of course that's the first thing you do, right? Yeah, I, I like that. That reminds me of a meme, by the way, Mike, which is like a uh, software engineers yeah. usually they spend they spend two weeks automating something that could have been done like in five minutes manual work. So where, <laughs> where for engineers? Where for engineers do you think is this threshold between, okay, I'm going to automate this with low code or whatever. I'm just going to automate it versus I'm just going to do it manual over and over again. Yeah, uh, that's a problem because we always fall in the same trap. We think something that must be automated because it's going to happen yeah. over and over again. And then it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, you automate something, you think it's going to, it would get automated in, in two or three days work. Well, you're still working on it after three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes you just do things four, five, six times, and then you realize, oh man, I could have automated the whole task just within two minutes. I could have saved me eight hours of my time. Mm -hmm. I guess there's no right or wrong answer. Like when, when to start, when to stop, I guess it's all experience. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you just have to explore. I guess that's the problem with low code here. If you know it, then you can automate a lot. But you have to really be smart about okay when to use it and when not to use it, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't mean, you build just a library? Can you just yeah, yeah? We'll get back to the example. Could you just build maybe yeah. a library of examples or templates over time? So basically, people just have a library. Maybe in a company, they just have Sonera templates, and you just use it whenever you need it, or you expand it, you make it smaller. Maybe this is kind of the yeah, future of using Sonera templates. That, that's what we're trying to do, really. That's what we're aiming to do. Not only templates, but pretty much gray boxes that people could use eventually at some yeah. point. And the problem is always that you don't know what you don't know. If you mm -hmm. barely know local, you're just getting into local. You, you don't even know what local is capable of. 
So we have yeah. to understand what people want to do with low code. And I'm saying that we have to understand this, but we have to guess. Like as soon as they start, we have to guess what they want to do and then make suggestions. And maybe we spark the interest or maybe we hit a nerve and we directly find out, okay, that's what they need. That's what they want. We have the right gray box for you here. Stop searching. Stop automating something that's already automated. And I think that's 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 what we got to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe could you talk about one example, maybe from your experience at Cineo, where you kind of took something that was a manual, very tedious task, and you just quote unquote, I'm going to use a chat GPT word here, revolutionized the whole process <laughs> from yeah. beginning to the end. Like, could you have one like example that, that you mentioned? Yes, yeah, something really trivial. Um, it doesn't involve high technology. It's basically a very simple cat part that can be designed literally in five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look, take a deep, deeper look, um, there's some caviar to it. There's, there's manufacturing that comes in because there's a pre-deformed uh, state and a deformed state of the part that is part of the manufacturing process. And now you think about how do you bring in a manufacturing process into the design? Then mm -hmm. you have to bring in FEA. So, so a very simple part can become very complex uh, quite fast. And, and here's a, this is really the example. You can't do this with just simple scripting and Python because you're building a logic. You're trying to, to, yes. to bring your manufacturing expertise, your, your, your empiric values that you gain from your working with the parts every day into code. And I think that's really the key is that, that you're not just writing code or software, you're actually converting your manual process, the things that happen in your mind every day into something that's actually in the computer. So your own logic becomes virtual. Yeah, I like that, Mike. That kind of reminds me of that, uh, you know, you probably have heard that AI won't substitute you, but an engineer using AI will. And I think in the future, to thinking about the job market, I think the engineer yeah. who will be the most successful, quote unquote, is going to be the one who is more the generalist. And he knows exactly at which stages he uses high code versus low code and like can execute quickly. Like, hey, I'm going to use, I know how to use low code. I'm going to use it when it's like applicable and or I'm going to use Python or C sharp, whatever, when it's applicable. So maybe this is how the job of an engineer will change. I'm not sure what you think. No, I'm with you. I think this, this is right. This is, this is correct. I think we, have, we just become smarter. Like we, we become broader with our knowledge yeah. uh, and make quick decisions. Okay, here I'm going to use low code. Here I'm not going to mm -hmm. use low code. Really, it's not just deep, deep dive experts that can know everything in one particular section become pretty generalist, as you said. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else we have missed regarding like maybe your own expertise, something you want to tell the audience, Mike? Some kind of learnings over the last year that you've had in the industry versus now at Sonera, which is, which is yeah. a startup, by the way. Uh, well, we're not a startup anymore. I think we're scale, scale up. up. Scale, scale up, up yeah. yeah. The startup just started yesterday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. old. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, the, an experience I made over the years is that it's never the technology that's a barrier. It's always the people. It's it's the mindset of the people. Technology is never the hurdle to introduce new designs or techniques. It's um, people's process. And, then, and that's kind of crazy. I see it with my son and he's just three and a half. He's very process driven. You break the process, he freaks out. And I feel like uh, that's not going to change when we get older. It actually gets worse. Um, mm. You know, Germans saying like, oh, we've always done it the same that way. You know, we're not going to change it because you're new. Uh, it's it's getting even worse. I think people people are so process driven. They don't want to change. And then you have these disruptive forces in some companies, these individuals that have really the energy and the power to change things. Um, so that's an ongoing fight. And I think it's not going to change until we really change our mentality how we think about, you know, innovation, how we want to evolve uh, as engineers in society. So I think technology, not the problem, the mindset of the people that must change. Yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, point. Maybe we can close the podcast with this. Also, that people have to think about maybe not being too stuck in their own thinking and maybe have, give it a try. Uh, I'm going to put a link down to kind of a 14 day free trial, uh, some resources, white papers, blogs, interviews, 
and from Sonora yes. down in the description so people can check it out. And if you want to get in touch with Mike, I'm also going to put down his LinkedIn profile in the description yes. as well. So uh, please do not spam him. But yeah, if you have any questions regarding low code in general, have some issues, yeah. maybe you're working on FEA, manufacturing problems, uh, CAD, whatever, reach out to Mike. So with that, thank you very much, Mike. It was a uh, nice session, short and crisp. Um, hope to have you in the second part in the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Yusuf. Thanks so much.